Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this roundtable meeting. Let me turn down my computer here. I'm getting some feedback. So good afternoon and welcome to this roundtable meeting and to the continuation of the IURC's stakeholder process regarding the implementation of FERC Order 2222. We appreciate all who have joined us here this afternoon. My name is Steve Davies. I serve as the Senior Assistant General Counsel at the Commission. Uh, joining me today from the Commission is our General Counsel Beth Helene, the Director of our RPP Division, uh, Brad Borum. I see one of our, uh, I believe, Chief uh, Technical Advisors from RPP in the back. Ren, how you doing, buddy? Fantastic. Am I missing anybody else from the IURC? Oh, and Cassie, who is handling all of our IT needs uh, this afternoon. Thank you for that, Cassie. We would be lost without you. Some quick housekeeping. Uh, the restrooms are located directly um, across from the, uh, from the hearing room here, sort of back in the corner, uh, men's and women's room. The code right now, I believe, is still for August, so it would be 0823. Um, at least as of half an hour ago, it was 0823, so if they've changed it, it'll be 0923, but that's the code to get into the restroom. Uh, we'll be taking short breaks today between presenters. We'll be wrapping up around 4 o'clock. Uh, to ask questions or to make comments in the room, feel free to use a microphone, and please do introduce yourself. We have sign-in sheets in the room. You only need to sign in on one of them, but please do sign in. Um, and please note that sign-in is required if you're an executive branch lobbyist. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to continue our discussions and hopefully to identify areas where rules may be needed in implementing FERC's Order 2222 here in Indiana. The agenda for the meeting is available in hard copy here in the room and on our website. Uh, this afternoon, we've invited a few DER aggregators to present. Uh, Voltus, Sea Power, and Octopus Energy will be presenting for us. Uh, Collaborative Utility Solutions will also give a presentation uh, at the end of our day regarding its nonprofit DER data registry. Following this meeting, we will post a set of notes on our website outlining today's discussions. Written comments are always welcome and may be submitted via li a link on our website or by uh, emailing us directly at urccomments at urc.in.gov. And uh, with that, I think, uh, I think we're ready to get started. Do, do we want to do intros in the room, you think? Or? I think in the interest of time, we just go into the presentations. Um, so our first presentation this afternoon will be from Sea Power. And uh, Ken, you want to introduce yourself? You have to pull that microphone right There we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Raise your hand and close yeah. your mouth. Yeah, you have to get close. Okay. okay, well, first I want to thank the, the IURC and the participants in this, in this workshop for giving me this opportunity today. And, and for those in attendance and the millions watching on the internet, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit today about uh, aggregation and, and making the, the DER rule work in, in Indiana. I'm Ken Schisler. I um, um, lead the regulatory affairs team for Sea Power. Uh, I'll just skip to my next slide because it or who I am is, is part of who C Power is. So C Power is one of two companies, uh, DER aggregators that have kind of been around since that is still around. That was has been around since the infancy of of this industry around a little after the turn of the century in its modern form. We operate uh, throughout the uh, RTO ISO markets uh, with every in every region except for Southwest Power Pool, um, and we also have programs with directly with utilities in a number of states as well. And so that's the slide here. Overall, we, we, we operate um, with both demand response, storage, and energy efficiency in relevant to Indiana in both, uh, both PJM and the MISO markets, uh, including we, we, we have um, customers in Indiana as well. So um, maybe that's enough for an intro. Cassie, my button here and working. There we go. Maybe I need to point it. There we go. Um, all right, so I liked the framework for this workshop that uh, was, was on the website for sort of the questions that were posed. So I kind of set up my presentation to talk about what Indiana is doing right. And by the way, I know we're going to have questions at the end. I'm going to try to save some questions, but if there's something I've not clarified, I can have eyes in the back of my head. So please just speak up or, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to clarify as we go through and answer questions at the end. Um, what is Indiana doing right? Uh, I credit Indiana for adopting one of the first models in the Midwest for how aggregators can work with utilities in a cooperative way so that the utilities can get the benefit of the load flexibility that their customers have. Um, I don't know exactly what year the current tariffs were adopted, but I would say it was probably in the 2011-2012 timeframe 
when um, no other state except Illinois, which has, of course, a different regulatory construct in the Midwest, was, um, was looking to solve this problem. What is important and beneficial about this approach is that it enables uh, the utilities in Indiana to procure from aggregators the, uh, the load flexibility and then to take that resource and have that count toward their resource plan. Ag DER aggregators are not in competition with utilities. We are not, we, we sh hopefully shouldn't in have an adversarial relationship. We may have policy disagreements here or there, but we're not selling retail electricity. Uh, we operate in both regulated and deregulated markets. What, what we really are good at is um, marketing load flexibility and packaging load flexibility together uh, and then making and monetizing that in the, in the wholesale markets. So kudos to Indiana for adopting this type of a model. Later in my presentation, I'm gonna talk about another model that actually, in my opinion anyway, should be considered because it, it may work better from a planning perspective for, for utilities. Um, but the model, you know, although Indiana has a model, I don't know what the statistics are, but I would, I would venture a guess that while there are, every one of the investor-owned utilities in, in Indiana has a tariff on file, the participation under those tariffs is probably abysmally low. Um, I, and again, I have no information specifically, but my suspicion is, is even though the tariffs exist and the model framework is, a, is, is just fine, uh, I suspect there's, um, there's a low participation because of some of the barriers I'm gonna talk about today. What is successful, now that we have Order 2222 and there's a, it's a pretty complex uh, rule, what can we do now to smooth the path towards implementation? And I've said in the comments that we've submitted uh, in the workshop docket, uh, part of it is, is let's like follow the KISS principle, keep it simple, and let's start with the things that we have available to us today to work with. The DER rule, uh, even if all of the tariffs were final, which they are not in either MISO or PJM, and even if all of the manuals were written and they're not even yet in draft form, um, we're still going to be three to five years away from um, having a workable, serviceable model um, in PJM and maybe even a little bit farther away in MISO. MISO itself doesn't want to deal with this issue until the end of the decade. Um, so we have some time, but that's the, maybe the good news, um, but we should not just simply wait to do nothing until then because although there is a basic model, um, I don't believe that the, the regulatory landscape is conducive to what's going to come once as we, continue, we, we, saw, we see DER resources coming on. And by the way, these DERs are coming whether or not there's a regulatory framework. In fact, I think we would maybe all sort of recognize that having a regulatory framework in which the utility regulators not only know of the DERs and the utilities know of the DERs, but know what they're doing is a much better framework than having them doing their own thing in sort of the underbrush and not being able to plan your system around this massive new resource that's out there. So hopefully what we, we can do is get a model that works right for the state for the utilities as well as uh, um, is integrated into the wholesale market. So, and, and as I said in our comments, I think the place to start to really kind of build that experience is uh, getting better about our demand response approaches. All right, so this is the current model. Um, and these, this graph is reproduced in our comments. I'm sure this presentation will be on the internet afterward. But the basic model in, 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 in Indiana for all utilities, including AEP and, and the MISO utilities, is that the lead market participant, if a customer participates in demand response, is the utility itself. The aggregator can have a relationship with the customer and the aggregator under the current tariffs can receive the compensation, but the utility is the lead market participant and MISO facing. In other words, not only do they get the credit for the megawatt, uh, but they are also required for all of the detail relevant to that uh, demand response customers' participation in the wholesale markets, um, and they get paid when the resource performs, and they get the penalties when the resource doesn't perform. And then that 
relationship passes through to the aggregator. Um, this model, like I said, it, it created a model for aggregators to be able to work, but I, you know, respectfully, that's putting an awful lot of responsibility on the utility, and you don't need to do all of that to get, all the, to get the utility to get the benefits of it. Um, and it also has some drawbacks because the, uh, the, because the way the risk of the performance penalties are assigned to the utility, the relationship, the ultimate relationship is directly to the customer, which prevents the ability to do portfolio aggregation. And I'll talk about that on this slide here. So when I talk about aggregation, I'm not talking about more, we are much more than just a, a uh, collector of customers. What an aggregator does is we have, we have end users that have very different uh, loads that are flexible loads. Some, you know, a hospital may have distributed generation. A hospital may also be able to deal with some lighting and some other things that are, that are flexible. Um, and those flexibilities have some characteristics. They may only be able to dispatch for an hour or two hours or four hours, uh, or they may need an hour of notice, advance notice might not be available in the evenings, but they're available on weekends. Every load has those types of attributes. So whether you can see on the slide, whether it's a university or a commercial office building or a big box store, they have different attributes. The things that aggregators are really good at is taking all of those different abilities, looking at the programs and putting that customer group together and having them perform as a unit and get evaluated on a unit. Because any one of those customers on any given day may not be able to do precisely what MISO is asking them to do. But if you've built your portfolio right, the rest of the customers can, and, the rest, and, and if you've managed your, your portfolio correctly, you can insulate yourself from penalties through this sort of insurance risk pool type concept. Because the current Indiana model makes the utility the lead market participant and the tariff runs directly to the end user, the Indiana model requires those penalties to be passed back to that, ND, to that end user. So you can have a situation where that hospital who can do most of what MISO or PJM wants or needs, but not all of it, that customer name may not be able to participate at all because the risk of suffering the penalties, which by the way can be in excess of the annual amount you can earn for the year uh, from performance in one event, um, that the risk of non-performance is so high and there's no way under the current Indiana model to bring that together. So again, as we think about Order 2222 and facilitating DER aggregators and aggregation, the number one thing we need to fix is creating the ability for aggregation to happen. Uh, but the basic model of the utility procuring the uh, um, uh, resources, the capacity, is, is, is there's nothing wrong with that model. So um, I don't want to be too negative. Like I said, I'm more positive than I am negative. All of these problems are fixable, but there, it's, it's, uh, there are a couple of other issues that I think if we do focus on fixing the DR construct, um, we, we should f focus on. Uh, for the MISO utilities, the, I, I, I think I looked at all of the IOU tariffs, and all of them are keyed to MISO's DRR construct, and DRR means something specific in the MISO market. It's a specific participation model for larger customers, uh, which pre and, and, and must be larger than one megawatt of curtailable load, which, which is a lot. There aren't very many customers who can qualify for that. Um, the real action for most customers is participating under the load modifying resource construct, and that um, the minimum size is 100 kW. Um, so I, one thing I would address would be, would be that. Um, the, the other thing that the MISO tariffs do is allow participation through the emergency DR tariff. And again, these were written a, a decade ago. That emergency DR tariff has a very limited use case application. That isn't, uh, so you wouldn't ever expect wide participation under that tariff. So just because it's limited to the, only the largest of customers, I wouldn't expect to see much participation in the MISO market, and, and I think we can do better uh, with the benefit of, of the history that we have in the MISO market to open it up to, uh, for, to allow for LMR participation. AEP, the tariff is constructed around their obligations in the PJM market, which require them to make a three-year forward commitment to the market. 
So the end use customer contracts require you to commit for four years in order to allow that. And then if you're going to withdraw, you have to give them, I think, three years notice. Um, that's a pretty big question mark for customers. That's a risk that we'll take on because if a customer leaves our portfolio, we'll just go find another customer. But to put that kind of an obligation on the customer is a, is a somewhat powerful deterrent. I understand why AEP did it, because it's, construct, can, um, it's constructed around their obligations to the PJM market. An easy way to fix that would be to allow the, the, the CSP or the, the aggregator to have that requirement um, and allow like the, the aggregator to meet that requirement by through customer subs, substitution. Again, I think it's an easy fix. The last one is I think there's a, a relic in, in the tariff that existed prior to the implementation of Order 745, uh, in which compensation under at least one of the tariffs I read in the MESA portion of the state, uh, that the way it works now post Order 745, after the Supreme Court has decided, is customers get paid their full low, um, energy price when they participate in demand response. And because that energy, because that payment reduces the cost to the system, the, that costs are not allocated back to the load serving entity associate or the re utility associated with a the customer. They're, they're socialized across the market. The tariffs, however, say that the customer, if they participate in demand response, they have to pay back to the utility for the electricity as though they had consumed the electricity. I think that's a problem because the utility doesn't have to buy the electricity and doesn't have to serve the customer. The utility is getting literally money for free. And the, that, that, uh, I think that's, again, a relic. Uh, um, there was a, there was a, prior to Order 745, there was some recognition that compensation should be the net of the energy price minus the retail, the foregone retail rate. That regime wasn't adopted, but that's what's embedded in at least one of the utility tariffs. So there's some other things that we could we could address if we fix the Indiana model, um, uh, if we put those a couple issues on the table. So here's what I would do differently than what we currently have. I would make the aggregator the lead market participant, the MISO facing market participant, with for the only for the load flexibility, not the retail supply obligation. That stays with the utility, but only for their demand response capability. However, the aggregator can't just do whatever it wants with those customers that are customers of the, of the utilities. The relationship between the utility and the customer and the aggregator would be governed under a tariff like what you have right today. Okay, so that would govern the relationship, but the aggregator is on the hook for the performance penalties. The aggregator is on the hook to deliver the obligations that they've committed to the market. And the way it works is the aggregator registers the customer, transfers the capacity credit to the utility, and then the utility will make those zonal resource credits part of their resource plan to satisfy their obligation, whether they participate through a FRAP or uh, self-scheduling or PRA, the, the resources that the aggregator is bringing that are procured, that are developed from customers of the utility would then uh, uh, satisfy that utility's obligation. And then the utility would pay the aggregator for that resource like they would to uh, any other entity that they were buying power from. Um, the, the term DR feed-in tariff is frankly a term that, that I adopted in a white paper that we wrote to sort of describe the basic model. You can call it whatever you want. Your model now sort of does this, but the only difference is that MISO-facing responsibility um, is with the utility rather than with the aggregator. And, and I think we can do better and, have a, and, 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 and actually reduce the workload uh, for the utility as well. All right. So... Um, I mentioned when I started that there's, just checking my time here, that there, there is a potentially another model that might work just as well and may even have some um, benefits from a planning perspective. So the, the current model, it's a tariff. Customers bring the resource and every year they sign up or not. Um, and, um, you know, the relationship is governed. But what 
what the utility may want if it's trying to plan ahead for five years or 10 years is it may want to procure on a longer term basis. It may want to say, okay, we're gonna buy 25 or 50 megawatts of demand response. We're gonna let aggregators bid to serve that. And then that 25 or 50 megawatt, five, 10 year, whatever the commitment, could be three, whatever the, the length of the commitment is, is an obligation that's imposed upon the DR aggregator. And then also obviously the DR aggregator needs to have access to the customers to work with the customer. If you do that, then the utility can put it into a longer term resource plan. The economic relationship, in fact, I'll flick back to that previous slide again, it's literally the same. The only difference is, is how you procure it. One procures it through a tariff, and then this one procures it through like an all source RFP or uh, through a, another type of bilateral procurement. And it's not terribly different than um, a PPA that a utility would have today with an independent power producer. All right, I think I'm almost through my slides. So I'm going to maybe, I haven't seen any questions shouted out at me yet. So I'll, uh, I'll keep going and then hopefully I will leave a little time at the end for questions. So what else should we do? You know, everything I've been talking to about this point is facilitating these resources from participating as capacity, energy, or ancillary services in the MISO market. Well, you know, we're at a place where these DERs are going to be necessary to facilitate uh, money more electric vehicles in, in some places where the grid doesn't necessarily support it yet, uh, where you're going to be converting for lots of reasons. The housing sector will be converting over to more, consume more electricity. You know, the transportation sector will be migrating in that direction. Um, and you're going to have these, these DERs doing, able to do things, and unless you create a mechanism for the utility to access them, they're going to be providing benefits to the wholesale market, but they're not going to be doing anything to help you defray the cost of a new substation or defer a new substation by allowing um, the utility to have some dispatch control. So the, the way to do that is, is to harmonize, allow the participation to occur at the wholesale market level under an arrangement where the utility is buying the resource anyway. But then because the utility would also want to be able to you know, manage network congestion on the distribution system, that the utility would have an option that would ride along with that where the customer could make that DER available to the utility. And there are a few models out there. The one I like, oh, and it, this is a really cost-effective way to do it because you know, the cost of getting able to participate in demand response are sunk. They're already participating in the wholesale market. The means to dispatch them, the means to measure the load reductions, the means to account for it are already established. We're just adding a new program and a new set of rules that would uh, allow for dual participation um, uh, in to, 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 to deal with network or distribution system grid relief. The, um, I think this might be my last slide. Um, program that I would recommend that you take a look at is actually uh, all of the New York utilities have them, uh, but this is what I'm talking about. Really hard to see on the slide, but there are two, there's actually more than two, but these two pr programs in particular really focused on distribution system benefits. So customers in New York, they have the ability to participate in the New York ISO uh, wholesale market with demand response, and they do that. But some customers who have more load flexibility are able to also sign up for one or the other of these two programs to provide some additional benefits that strictly go to the utility. And they are, you know, they were approved through a utility commission proceeding and have to be cost effective. Um, the first program, you can see, it's hard to say, there's, they are notified essentially day before that they're gonna have to be dispatched the following day. Well, that advance notice is less useful to the utility, but it does provide some benefit, particularly if the resource is large. The other one, it's two hour forward notice for, for dispatch. That's the basic difference. <laughs> that one's got a lot more flexibility that allows the utility to react to changing conditions that are happening in real time. So what else should we be doing besides creating the opportunity to access the wholesale market? Um, then after you do that, you then, give utilities the ability to leverage that resource to participate in a dual participation program. All right. Uh, okay, so this is just a little bit of the stuff that I probably should have said when I was just introducing the concept. 
I'm not talking about double counting here. I'm not talking about getting paid twice for the same dispatch. I'm talking about for the, the, the resource doing something different and getting paid for doing that other thing. Um, again, the MISO will dispatch these resources to manage resource adequacy at the system level. Well, what happens if we've had a, an outage that's localized to Indianapolis and you need resources to respond to address that problem? MISO won't dispatch. That's a, that's a local utility issue. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to try to explain that last bullet because it'll take up too much time and chew up any time we may have for questions. That's it. So um, I said a lot. Are there questions or anybody want to react? Any spitballs at me? Sure. From presentation, Ken, I have one question. I believe you answered it. So the demand response time, you said two to four hours. Well, that was so um, in, in the PJM market, we have to respond within 30, 30 minutes. And if you're participating in an if you're participating in ancillary services, um, you have to respond even quicker than that. And some of them are like almost instantaneous. Okay, if you're doing frequency, you're following a signal. So different customers can do different things. Some, some customers are able to respond very quickly because it's fully automated. Some customers, you know, I like to use the example of an elevator bank. This building has an elevator bank. Before you shut down the elevator bank or maybe one of the four elevator banks, you better make sure there's no one in it, right? So that takes a little bit of time. So that's what that 30 minutes is, is designed to accommodate. So really, w if we have a variety of dispatch times, we can do different things with different customers that have different flexibility. I don't know if I was answering or anticipating your question. Yeah, you, you answered it. And I have one more question okay. surrounding safety. So in the event of storm response, and guys are going out in the field to restore service, are there any type of safety precautions you as an aggregator will take to make sure they don't uh, come across energized equipment? That's a great question. So um, the, um, when we are talking about demand response, the reason that's a great question is because that's a complication you don't have to worry about with demand response. Demand response is not an injection of energy. Demand response is a reduction of energy. So it could be, but let's take the example of the reduction of energy is occurring because there's a distributed generator that sits behind the meter. If that generator is running um, and there's a closed circuit or open circuit, I don't know, I'm a lawyer, not, not an engineer, uh, <laughs> then uh, that, that you, you could energize the grid. Um, for those types of interconnections, if the power goes out, there has to be a cut off. Okay, so we're not talking about injections right here, so we don't have to think about those issues. We will have to think about those issues once we get to full implementation of the DER rule where you will have injections, but for demand response, it's not an issue. Thank you. Uh, Sam Carpenter, who's your Environmental Counsel? Um, so on that, on that note, we're just referring to uh, load curtailment through the aggregator, and why are we not thinking about uh, generation from a distributed like rooftop level, that sort of thing? Well, I didn't say this at the beginning. Thank you for that question, too. The re other reason, I gotta get close to the, yeah, okay, I won't look at you. Uh, I'll just speak to the microphone, look at the camera. Um, All right. <laughs> so um, well, I didn't mention this, that all of these resources that we're talking about, whether it's distributed generation, battery storage, or pure curtailment, turning things off, all of them participate today as demand response. There are batteries in our, in our system that they are enrolled in the MISO and PJM demand response programs. They look like demand response, but what's providing that response is a battery or a hospital that have, they have to have a lot of redundancy baked into their system so that you know if the lights go out, they can still operate. There's a lot of flexibility there. It's mostly generation, um, and those generators can Will be the form of will be the form of response. They're already they already are able to participate today as demand response. In the future, under the DER rule, 
you will have the ability to go to zero and then start injecting energy. Um, that's a different model. Um, it's your, when, you, when you start injecting energy, you're selling electricity rather than, um, your, your, rather than demand response, which is actually a service. Um, so the, in the future, we will be able to do that. Um, the DER rule will allow that. But today, all of these resources are already participating under the DER rules, or DR, demand response rules. Is that on? One, one additional comment to that, as we've talked about in the other workshops, 1547 2018 has clearly defined rules around uh, disconnecting from grid number one. Number two, we did hear in the last workshop that evidently some people are not requiring the disconnect in their interconnection process rules. And um, per the comments that I made last time, I would encourage all the utilities, if you do not require this disconnect, in the interconnection process, the cost of that disconnect is nothing in comparison to a solar array, to a battery array, to any kind of generator. Require the disconnect, get it into your interconnection process, and you can keep utility line workers safe in that regard. I actually have never encountered a situation where our customers didn't, if they were using distributed generation, didn't have the disconnect in the event of a Yes. Yes. Microphone. So I, I am talking about, uh, I am talking, the question was, is like, is it an automatic disconnect or is it a switchover? Um, if it's, in the case of a power outage situation, it's an automatic disconnect. There are situations where uh, customers that we have with distributed generation want to run their, want to run their generation while there's still power and there's a demand response event being called, but what those customers are doing is cutting a load over to the generator. In other words, they're not, it's not running in parallel with the system. They're cutting a certain load over to the generator. So there's no interference with the grid from that generator. So I would encourage everyone to think about a separation of normal grid operation versus live line work. Um, in the event of live line work, uh, in your interconnection process, I believe going forward that we're going to need to develop better rules around live line work with all of these resources. Okay, so 1547, actually the committee, we've discussed this, um, but going forward, I think that structurally for these kinds of resources in a normal day-to-day -day operation and things that are going on, all of the interconnection rules, everything that Ken just mentioned, all of that is adequate and good. But in the event that you have a crew out working on a distribution line in a live line environment, I think that we are going to want to have very clear communication standards, AKA 1547-2018 with common communication protocols to be able to effectively isolate and make sure that these resources cannot be energized if we have guys on the line working. Okay, so I think that that is an incremental step uh, beyond what is there today. I think that pretty much everything that exists today covers safety, security, and everything, but I think that we do need some live line working principles going forward that are a little bit more specific as we go forward. All right, and I'm just gonna hit you with a 30,000 foot question in closing here. Um, what, what's the deal breaker for aggregators? What is it that puts the burden too great or that turns the business case on its head? I mean, is it? Uh... Um, well, the inability to actually manage a portfolio of resources means we can't offer a customized service to our customer. That, that customer that it may have limited ability, they can only operate for four hours, but the system will require that they be available for six. The deal breaker, which is one of the reasons why I think you probably see very little to no participation under these, is, is that current tariffs don't allow you to do that. If we could get that part of it fixed, I mean, obviously price and other things matter too, but the model, the basic idea of the utility buying, like I said, I'm supportive of that, but the, 
but the, the problem is, is today you can't aggregate, and that's kind of a deal breaker. Thank you, Ken. So we're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break, and then uh, we'll be back to hear uh, Voltus present.
All right, if everybody wants to take their seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, hello in the room. Check one, two. Hello in the room. Hey, guys, if everybody can take their seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. So our next presenter this afternoon is Voltus, and uh, Joan, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself and, uh, and take it away. And I think you'll need a microphone. Do be sure to speak into the microphone. Thank you. I will do so. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I am going to ask Mr. Schisler for the clicker. Thank <laughs> you. Um, uh, thank you for having me. I'm Joanne Worthington with Voltis, and um, we're probably going to have a little bit different focus than Mr. Schistler. He was talking more about um, one form of DER, which is demand response, which is you know the non-injectable one, and he made some good points about it being some low-hanging fruit where you can get a good paradigm and construct in place that allows um, aggregators to sort of optimize their their participation right now, but I was going to sort of um, backtrack through some of the <laughs> meetings that I did not attend and offer a couple of perspectives uh, based on uh, my admittedly imperfect summarization and review of what's been discussed um, prior to today. And so this is my very, oh, my, just push the button. Or is it like this? Ah, there we go. So I'll just start with a little bit more uh, description about myself, a little bit more description about Voltus, how uh, the program works at a really high level, and then some of the things we've, that you've talked about in the prior meetings, which were those jurisdictional regulatory issues that I think came up in the July meeting, and then some of those distribution operational interconnection issues that came up in the August meeting. And I'm going to, um, I have a phone a friend on the, <laughs> on the virtual meeting, Rao Conandina, who um, uh, me and Ken need to have t-shirts made. We're just lawyers, not engineers. But um, <laughs> I have a phone a friend engineer to help me when I get over my skis. So I hope you will indulge him if he needs to help me. Um, so who I am, um, I have been with Voltus uh, just a brief time. Um, I actually worked for AP for 15 years prior to working for Voltus, so I do have some of that traditional utility background and a, and a little bit of that perspective, so I'm not completely ignorant of <laughs> or um, uh, unsympathetic or, or non-empathetic to, to some of the concerns and issues they bring up. So I have a little bit of that perspective that I hope um, sort of infuses some of the things we say. Um, Voltus, in, and I'll just kind of scroll through, they're um, the only uh, DR platform that's in all of the energy markets in North America, including SPP. And I'm in Oklahoma, so I'm a little bit more familiar with SPP. Um, and one of the things that we bring to bear, and I think Mr. Schisler talked about allowing us to be the market participant will help really with these issues, is, is being able to get customers in a lot of different markets and a lot of different programs. And so, for instance, if we have a large retail operation, um, and those on the left represent the different type of customers that we have, you know, if you have like a, a large national retailer, they can be in all these markets, and we can really be flexible and, and, and stack them in different programs within one market or across markets, and they can sort of have a global view of their participation you know, North America wide or, or United States wide and all these markets and we can really customize the programs to maximize their revenue, to really conform to their ability to curtail and participate. A retail uh, organization might have a different profile and be able to participate in a different way than, you know, a university or, or, or an industrial manufacturer who can just say we're not going to make widgets for an hour versus a store who says we'll turn down our light or our HVAC and that might have a little bit of a curve to it. Uh, to ramp down, that sort of thing. And we can really customize uh, that relationship based on the customer and be very specific as opposed to a one-size-fits-all tariff option that many utilities sort of offer. Um, the, um, again, we're all in, in all the markets. And I think there's also this uh, concern that 
this is very newfangled, but I will say that, and Mr. Schischler pointed it out, a lot of the people, although these particular forms of these companies may be new, people at Voltus and at Sea Power and some of these other companies have been involved with demand response for, for a couple of decades. And these um, resources have been in, in these markets, particularly like PJM and, and MISO, for a long time, and they've developed processes and mechanisms for uh, integrating and incorporating these sort of things. So it's not completely new. I do think it's, it's new on this retail level, particularly since a lot of states opted out of, of aggregated demand response after Order 719 and 745 from FERC. But it, these things have been operating and, and operating safely and successfully for a long time. Um, and Voltus is, is, is one of the leaders in the market and, and a lot of their the leadership at Voltus was a part of all of those prior orders, 719, 745, FERC order 2222. So they have a lot of um, expertise, history, and perspective that I think is valuable. Um, how it works, and, and I think there's a, a little bit of a concern of, of transparency, um, and I'm hoping you all can see this better than I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I don't see well, so I will acknowledge that. Um, we have an agreement with the customer, and we think that should probably remain between the ARC and the customer so that that's a private business relationship. But in terms of the external parts of it, we get data from the, the customer. But then after that, there's actually quite a bit of interfacing with the RTO, with the ISO, and with the local distribution utility. So all of the ISOs require us to notify the local distribution utility and the local regulator um, of the registration. And we give them the name of the load, the megawatts offered, who the retail provider is, and the targeted effective date. And they all have different timelines for responding and objecting, but they all allow the LDC to object or the, or the um, regulator to object and to, to ask questions about double counting. If they say this customer is in a retail program that we think is a direct conflict, that kicks off a communication and clarification process in all the R RTOs and ISOs where they want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, we get interconnection data from the utility, um, and we can do that directly with a lot of utilities. A few of them require us to ask the RTO to ask the utility to send that information. But either way, they're still in that process. We do a curtailment plan. We have a device that we call a Voltlet, which is a KYZ pulse um, device that essentially gets more granular data than the meter um, so that we can... Uh, do the, the dispatch measurement verification and that we need to do to participate. Um, we do a dispatch verification process to test the participation, and they have to have ICCP integration. All the RTOs and ISOs require us to have telemetry that's integrated with the system so we can receive dispatch signals, and all the RTOs and ISOs require that information to be available to the utilities. So that information that shows the dispatch and and, and all those things that the same information that SPP or MISO or PJM uses to verify participation is available to the utilities. And then after that, we'll designate that once we go through all that process and make sure all that's done, then we can designate the registration as dispatchable and then we get our signals from the RTO and help facilitate the customer participating and, and, and responding to those dispatch signals and curtailing. Um, this is how payment works. It's a little flow chart. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling down on my device. and <laughs> on the, that's, the, that's the voltage that gets the KYZ pulse from the utility meter and get, puts it in a more granular form. And then we have an interface with the customers where they can see their participation and, and see how much uh, revenue that they'll obtain from that particular dispatch and that sort of thing. And then they can, there are different ways for them to slice and dice, crunch and view the data. Um, so we have the customer and, you know, the RTO will send a dispatch signal to us and then we will then signal the customer in some way and we have different ways of doing that. Some of them literally have some sort of signal on site or text or email, um, all sorts of communications. And then we help them curtail. Um, we do a lot of work on the front end uh, developing their curtailment plan. Then 
we the data goes back to the to the uh, RTO showing how much they dispatch, like to what percentage, and the RTO decides if there's a payment or a penalty, and we bear all the p penalty risk, and that's another thing that um, Ken talked a little bit about. With the way we customize our programs, we're able to bear that that penalty risk for customers and just give them the revenue that, that we've agreed and projected to provide them and we handle all that sort of process for the customers and their job is just to curtail and we take care of all that back end process for them. Um, in terms of regulation, my understanding and I'm sure Mr. Davies or anybody else will correct me is that we talked a little bit about public or energy utility status in a prior meeting and I think there may or may not have been a consensus that we fell under that. And I, I did want to, I'm assuming that's to do with the precedent and jurisprudence in Indiana. I know that in some states with similar language, we are not a utility, we're not considered to be transmitting and providing electricity. If it's not you know, dispatchable, DER, that's not interjecting. If it's just curtailing, there may be a question, but I understand that there is some prior discussion on that. I think there was also a discussion about, oh, I'm still not, I'm looking at it on my thing, sorry. So I think um, there was some discussion about the Indiana Code and declination of jurisdiction, and that did sound like that might be a, a feasible path, but I did, I did have concerns, and I guess I wanted you all to take under consideration how the process would work, because I know you have the process in your regulations that the utilities follow, but I don't think we want it to become so involved and so burdensome and it, it to relitigate basic issues. Do you know what I mean? That that you're trying to work through in this process. So I didn't know how your regulations were going to sh make sure that process was, you know, didn't become a barrier to entry for, for different arcs by, by it becoming a really long, lengthy, appealed, you know, litigated type, you know, like a rate case or a fuel case where it wasn't just, okay, this is, it's, it, you know, most of this is wholesale and we just want to make sure customers are being taken care of and that the utility knows they're there, which is happening a lot at the RTL level. So if we could, one consideration is to bring some of that information about that RTO process to that declination type of proceeding and, and rely a lot on that. Another option that um, we've seen in a couple of the SPP states that we've worked in, in Oklahoma, um, there is a tariff, and, and that's the docket number that, of the case, where these, utility, these uh, jurisdictions have said a way to make sure we have some visibility and transparency is to have the customer, who is the one in that regulated relationship with the utility, say what they're doing. So, they, you know, their terms of conditions require the, the customer to say, I am participating at wholesale in this program. These are the, this is the information that I've provided at registration about how I plan to participate so that you have that, it, it serves that customer protection function you're talking about that you know the customer's consented to the relationship and that they understand the relationship. It can require data provision to the utilities, but from the customer who's in a, you know, in a position to know what they've been doing. Um, it keeps you from kind of conflicting with any of the MISO or the PJM rules about wholesale participation or the things they plan to do on fork order 2222 implementation, because that's, I think, a large concern of, of ours and, and probably some of the other um, aggregators is that you get this patchwork of inconsistent requirements that each state has different requirements which are then different than the RTO ISO requirements and then there's no harmonization and consistency. And so I think that if you just have the customer sort of providing you some reporting and some and, and information, it makes it easier to avoid that sort of um, inconsistency or conflict. And then it kind of creates less regulatory burden because the commission is only involved when there's like a dispute as opposed to having to be involved at the front end for a lot of pro forma sort of things. The, 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 the customer provides this data to their, their distribution utility and says, I'm going to be participating. Is there a problem? And it doesn't really come to you until it's a problem as opposed to you having to process everything 
ahead of time. It's just something to consider. And then it keeps that contract between the customer and the ARC as a private business arrangement while you can still have that visibility for that customer protection and making sure the utility is getting certain data from their customers about their participation. So that's another way of looking at it as opposed to um, it, asserting this more active jurisdiction, you can work through the, the customer utility relationship to make sure that data is being exchanged. Um, I know at the operational meeting, um, there was, uh, there seemed to be an expression of that there needed to be a lot more time to add in, uh, you know, these advanced distribution management systems or distributed energy um, resource management systems. And I think the first point is that's for injecting. So for the traditional demand response, you don't really need all those advanced sort of technologies really because those things are being done now <laughs> and that information is getting reported and that thing, those things can be studied now without such advanced systems. Now I do agree with Mr. Schistler and the, and the utilities that as you start getting greater penetration of that dispatchable distributed energy, you're going to need probably some more advanced systems, but it should be, well, let me not say it should be, I think the commission should be conscious of making sure that that's incremental to the level of distributed energy resource penetration. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, if, you, if it's done at an incremental level um, commensurate with the level of penetration, that allows you to step back and do your regulatory role of having them, you know, prove the reasonableness and use usefulness and prudence in these increments as opposed to we're going to install this wholesale system across our distribution system as opposed to like on a circuit by circuit basis, this is how much penetration we have, this is the need, this is the prudence, this is all the things you need. So it doesn't have to be there um, all in once. <laughs> it's, it's, it should be commensurate with the the, the, the penetration of DER. So I think uh, we're just saying the commission should be conscious of how the utilities are bringing that to you and saying, and how much is necessary at each stage of, of integration. Um, there's, you know, you, all, you always require that engineering and that financial evidence for any particular infrastructure, and you just want to make sure you're still providing that for ADMS and DE. Um, yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right. I'm looking at my screen. So I, 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 you just want to make sure that that's all incremental and that, you know, you're still applying your traditional regulatory standards because it's not, it's not, um, you don't have to leapfrog over your traditional standards or countenance anything more than your, the normal incremental investment levels that you would require for anything else. It should be commensurate with that level of penetration. So you don't have to wait um, for these entire systems to be fully implemented to start um, permitting um, DERs to be integrated. You, you know, the technology just needs to match. It doesn't have to overshoot. Um, distribution study. So one of the things that that came up on the operational meeting that I did not attend was how they could do intribution studies and they wanted very granular information, but I think the ARC position is they really should be studying this at the aggregate level. Aggregators need that flexibility to mix and match, which was the point of FERC order 2222 and is the value that we bring. And we have different um, resources mixed in one aggregation and we need to be able to mix and match those. And as long as the, we meet the overall, we don't exceed the limit of the aggregation that we've already told the utility and told the RTO that we're gonna account for, they should be able to study those. Um, there have always been component DERs, Mr. Schistler pointed out, they're out there now. They have to be accounted for now. Um, your interconnection process should give you the component information. Um, that you need, which is, you know, where it is on the system, what it is, and how it's interconnected to your system. Then you get that aggregate resource info from that wholesale market registration and from that ICCP telemetry information that you get. 
And then you can do your study assumptions. Just assume that all those resources can operate at their full capacity. Assume that there's maximum load masking. And this happens in other jurisdictions. Assume that they can participate at wholesale. Those are what happens in studies. You just assume that they can do what they're going to do, and you study in that fashion. Requiring all these different levels of granular information is probably not what you need to really do the effective study. So that would be um, our position. And keeping us from being able to aggregate or change aggregations really would pretty much hamper. You talked about some of the market killing uh, Things. That's one of those things that will really impact our ability to serve customers. Um, and the ICO, ISOs and RTO, RTOs have standards where they determine what a material modification is to your resource. So if they don't consider it to be a material modification, then we kind of go by that federal system in, um, in determining you know, our flexibility to mix and match up to the limit. So. Um, it doesn't matter that there's a quote unquote change in the natural diversity or that we switch up the resources as long as they know the max and they have that individual information they got from the interconnection agreements. They can do the studies that they need to do is, is our position. Um, um, in terms of, I saw in some of the comments uh, this idea that we needed to go that MISO and PJM standards needed to be contradicted or challenged. And I think we were a little bit concerned about that because we do think that the RTOs and the ISOs have pretty extensive processes. Um, there's full and transparent participation by all stakeholders and they have some expertise. You know, I saw a proposal for, for this commission to determine credit worthiness, but we have credit worthiness and financial standards already at the MISO level and the PJM level. They require us to have the, the financial wherewithal to meet our obligations um, at that level. And having sort of conflicts or inconsistencies would probably not be helpful. Um, they also have the time requirements for the study and approval of registrations. They've had a lot of time to develop what they consider to be reasonable amounts of times for distribution utilities and railroads to object to registrations. And so I, I think we should probably not create a lot of confusion by having different timelines or conflicting timelines, particularly when these ARCs are operating across, you know, broad um, systems and are, are keeping track of all these registration timelines and that sort of thing. Having a lot of different ones across states could be problematic. The RTOs and ISOs have the telemetry requirements. I don't think you necessarily need a lot of new metering and that sort of thing if we're, if we're complying with those telemetry and metering requirements. Um, the RTOs and ISOs actually do require performance measurement and verification. They um, exact penalties if we don't perform um, to the degree that, that we're required to. And like I said, they require, they give notice to the local balancing authority about the enrollments, the dispatches, the performance. So that information is there. It's available to utilities um, to see how things are performing if they, if they want access to that information. Um, they, I saw a mention of utilities dispatching of ARC managed DERs, and that would be, we're concerned about that. Um, it's really concerning to say that the utilities will decide when an ARC managed DER can dispatch, but then leave the penalty risk on the ARC, you know, if they don't dispatch. I don't, that, that's particularly problematic. And then they are suggesting they need a lot of new technology to account for it, but we already have the technology. We can do the dispatching now. We're integrated with our customers now. We can participate in, um, in the um, wholesale markets with them now. So that's not incremental investment, incremental rate payer cost if we just do what we're already <laughs> set up to do. Um, and through a business relationship with our customers and not requiring, you know, the rest of the ratepayers to sort of shoulder that burden of us being able to do that dispatch. Um, there was a discussion about utility override of distrib distributed energy resource dispatches, and we would really like the commission to, uh, to require um, 
clear criteria that justify district. This is all sort of due process stuff to make sure there's clear criteria that would justify an override, um, procedures for advance notice, and, and after the fact justification review, just that there's some process that if they're going to, on the, on the level, on a, on a local level, have any sort of control over that, that there's some, uh, you know, objective, transparent sort of process for that, um, that, that we can see, and that since we would be bearing, you know, the risk. Um, let's see. Metering and telemetry. I know that there was an argument for separate production meters. And I, again, would just caution about pricey infrastructure investment and, and barriers to entry. Um, one of the things that's been done historically, and, and I think a lot of our engineers think would still work, is that you know a lot of them have AMI meters. I think a lot of your local utilities here are, 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 are along the way with their AMI implementation. And you have existing um, meters. And they have interval or metal, meter, sample metering, meter sampling techniques that you can then use you know, your statistical modeling to get a more broader view of your distribution system. So there are methodologies that won't require a lot of additional pricey infrastructure investments or require customers to put in a lot of extra meters and pay that cost and create that barrier to entry for customers. So I would you know, make sure that we've investigated some of our traditional methods that we've used before on uh, metering and telemetry and, and using statistical sampling to make sure that we, we can get information as opposed to a lot of extra metering. Um, so I think the basic um, conclusion is just on your regulatory view we, we talked about is whenever there's new infrastructure, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel on making sure that those things are justified as reasonable, um, used and useful, those are the things that an incremental implementation of those things would facilitate. Um, I would be really co consider, I would, I would be really judicious about the MISO and PJM processes and trying to conflict or override those processes. You know, everybody gets to participate at that FERC level and at that RTO and ISO level and it's harder I don't want to say it's harder, but not everybody is at the table sometimes at the local <laughs> level. So we want to make sure that that we're not throwing out that baby with the bathwater on the MISO and PJM and processes is where they've decided what reasonable processes are for registering DERs or what the telemetry requirements are and those sort of things. Um, we want to be careful about erecting barriers and and keeping, you know, ARCs from being able to work with customers, provide services that they might not be able to get from utilities just because of utility tariff model probably doesn't allow the same flexibility and the same customization that an ARC process would. And we just don't want duplicative and inconsistent standards. Um, we want Indiana customers to really not have to, to suffer from a lot of inconsistent standards um, duplicative standards when we can achieve those purposes maybe without, you know, conflicting with other processes. And I will stand for questions. Well, before I do that, Rao, did, was there anything you wanted to add or anything I missed? If you're there. Um, no, Joanne. Yeah, I'm here. Um, no, you did good, Joanne. Thank you. I did not have anything to add. Yeah, okay. thank you. I said I'm just a dumb lawyer. <laughs> so questions in the room? I see Ren in the back. Excellent presentation, Joanne. I do have just one quick question, um, more of a scenario. So if a Walmart or, or someone like that were to join uh, the aggregation, mm -hmm. how soon would that information be made available to the RTU? Is it almost instantaneous or is it daily or monthly or when, when will that information be made available? Um, we. As soon as we provide it to the RTO, they're usually pretty, um, we get the information and gather it from, I'll use SPP process, because that's the one I'm most familiar with, is we provide the registration information through the RMS system 
to SPP, and they, within the next couple of weeks, then send that a one to the utility and to the RERA, and then they have 45 days to object to it, because um, that's the sort of the minimum time for them. So that's, it's, it's not instantaneous, but it's pretty quick. It's not drawn out. I mean, it does take a few months for the whole process to occur many times, but in terms of how quickly the RTO communicates with the utility after we provide the registration to them, it's not a lot of time. Uh, Caleb Loveman with Indiana Michigan Power. Yes. Um, you had briefly touched a little bit on uh, the regulatory schemes and jurisdictional requirements, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I may have misheard or just didn't hear, but would you expect some sort of registration at the state level or only at the RTO level? So I know that there was discussion about registration at the state level. Um, what we were pointing out in the other jurisdictions is that it would probably, we would like the Indiana Commission to consider the customer being more of the registrant than the ARC, but we also understand <laughs> that they may be looking more at the state registration with that declination of jurisdiction process coupled with it. So we're not against that, but we just wanted them to take another look at, you know, getting that information and sort of getting that transparency by having the customer report to you and provide data to you about their participation in the wholesale market so that you're getting that information, but just from a different source, essentially. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll yeah. <laughs> so Joanne and I probably agree here, but the, you know, every state has a different statute of what is a utility. Right. What we don't do is we don't do what utilities do. <laughs> uh, we don't distribute power. We don't sell power to customers. Uh, but I think, you know, in any regulatory paradigm where you want to know what these companies are doing, they're talking to customers, they do have to interact with the utility. Um, we're not, cons if, if the statute says you have to be a utility, fine. What we would, to make the model work, that we would want to avoid is rate regulation of aggregators because we need that ability to customize the arrangement with the customer to get whatever capability they have that's got a certain value it's going to have a different value from customer to customer so we 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 are perfectly fine being regulated at least see power perspective um, but what we what we should avoid is um, rate regulation and i think i saw it on one of joanne's slides the terms between the customer and the aggregator, that's the special sauce of the business. That is highly proprietary. Whereas normally the, a utility tariff is a public tariff. Um, I don't, I don't, I, you wouldn't want the contract terms between a utility between an aggregator and the customer to be, uh, to be public. But other than that, we would, we would not object to regulation by a state commission. And that's why the, just to put a finer point on it, the, the proposal of having the customer regulate, you avoid some of those complications that Mr. Schistler is talk, talking about. For instance, like they're participating in a wholesale market and so you all then have to sort of tiptoe around, you know, your jurisdiction versus, you know, the wholesale jurisdiction on how they're participating in a wholesale market when you're a retail, uh, regula retail jurisdiction regulatory entity. So that's, we just felt like that customer providing data uh, may be part of their terms and conditions where they have to say, I'm participating in the wholesale market and this is my load and this is what I've registered to participate in to provide that transparency to the utility and to you without getting into that, that proprietary business relationship or worrying about what's wholesale and what's retail and that sort of thing. You're sort of focusing on the things that I saw articulated as the primary concern, like that customer protection issue and that provision of data and that sort of stuff. So that's just another way of getting at it without, you know, worrying about the things that Mr. Schistler's parsing out or that we're trying to parse out. But yeah, the 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 registration with the declination is a, is probably another way to get at it. I would just be concerned about the regulatory burden once you get lawyers and litigation type stuff going. <laughs> um, just. My 15 years experience tells me that's not always the, the quickest, cheapest way to, to do an administrative function if that's not your goal. Thank you so much for that presentation, Joanne.
Okay, let's go ahead and take five minutes and then we'll come back and uh, we'll introduce Rajiv Shah from Octopus.
All right, if we could start uh, getting back toward our seats. Hey, Scott. Okay, I'd like to take uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, to introduce Rajiv Shaw from Octopus Energy. Rajiv, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can uh, do a brief introduction, and if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing your screen, we're going to let you handle the advancement uh, of your slides during your presentation, if that's okay. Uh, no problem. Um, uh, th thanks. Just let me um, get the slides up there. Of course. Um, Uh, okay. There we go. Um, Steve, just confirming y'all can see. Um, yes, yes, we can see them great. Thank you. Excellent. Well, well, thank you uh, for having me and, and really appreciative of the commission. Steve, you, your willingness to allow me to join virtually. I'm really sorry I can't be there today. Um, so just a quick intro on myself. I am the head of US policy and markets for the Octopus Energy Group. Um, I, I've been in this role since uh, last November. Uh, before that, I had sort of progressively uh, responsible roles. Uh, responsible might be uh, generous for me, but but I, would, I was somewhat responsible. Uh, within the New York governor's office and, and various state agencies. Most recently, I was counsel for energy, environment, and agriculture to Governor Hochul. Um, left that stint uh, to, to join Octopus. And, and so just a quick agenda that I wanted to share with you all today is I'm going to give you a quick company overview, um, an intro to our tech platform, and a, a little bit deeper dive into its capabilities. Um, take you through some case studies on what we're doing around the world with DERs, um, and then provide some key insights that um, you, you know we think it's important to share from for what we think would be ideal um, in an order twenty two twenty two construct that you will be trying to stand up along with um, the the wholesale authorities. So. You know, Octopus Energy Group, it is a pretty multifaceted and young company um, with various um, different business arms or, or tentacles, as we like to say. Uh, we're, we're a certified B corporation. Um, that means we're, you know, we, we've committed and, and are adhering to really high levels of social and environmental responsibility. And it kind of... Um, is reflective of our overall mission and, and sort of founding thesis. Um, we're, we're a retail energy supplier in eight countries. We have 8 million customers um, sort of leading on customer service and, and driving demand side flexibility everywhere that we've entered. Um, as a retail supplier, we're aggregating resources in those markets. Uh, we, I'm going to skip the Kraken piece for a second and, and just quickly describe we have a generation portfolio, about $7 billion in renewable assets managed. Um, that's about three or more gigawatts in nine countries, mostly in the UK and Western Europe, although we have seeded uh, some funding and, and are standing up our first event, uh, investments there in North America. Uh, we have an energy services sort of catch-all uh, vertical that involves an EV leasing business, a um, 500,000 public charge point sort of charging network of charging networks where our customers uh, on the retail side are billed for their public charging on their energy bill. Uh, we're doing heat pump R&D manufacturing and installations along with solar storage, smart meter, electric vehicle charging in installation through that services arm. All of this is really powered through Kraken, our, our software platform. Um, the company was founded in 2016 by some tech savvy, savvy entrepreneurs who had a lot of experience in 
the enterprise software space and had the observation that the enterprise systems that are being deployed at utilities and energy companies are kind of stuck in the past. Um, they had deep experience with SAP and Oracle migrations and implementations with some major retail suppliers and utilities and thought they could do better. So they created Kraken to sort of be this end-to-end -end platform um, for utilities. Uh, of course, when you create something like that, no one wants to raise their hand and be sort of the first to validate it. So we became an energy supplier uh, in the UK in the first instance, really to just demonstrate the uh, capabilities of Kraken. Um, the, you know, in seven years, we've grown to be the second largest retailer in the UK and expanded our footprint remarkably and, and sort of validated the customer centric offering of Kraken along the way, uh, grown the licensing um, in, in the UK where we have 18% of the market as through the Octopus Energy retail supply business, we've actually licensed Kraken to 50% um, of the market there. Uh, a lot of our leading competitors um, have 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 sort of joined with us, or not really joined with us, but but leveraged our software platform to to sort of transform their businesses. Um, so, what is Kraken? It is um, an operating system, if you will, for utilities. Um, it's an end-to-end -end platform that we created to enable future energy cases and more on that in the next slide. And it enables a reimagined customer centric uh, service model. Um, you, you know, it is, as you see here on the left side of your screen, all of the things that you would associate with, with the customer side of the utilities IT functions, um, CIS, meter data management, CRM, customer interaction, that meter to cash function. And then the right side, uh, Kraken Flex um, is what we refer to it internally, it is your asset optimization engine. Uh, DERMS for lack of a better acronym, but it is a tech platform that we built to enable everything from sophisticated management of behind the meter, DER assets and, and front of the meter grid scale resources like batteries or peakers. Um, at the end of the day, Kraken Flex um, is a platform that is well suited to kind of delivering um, the eventual order 2222 uh, implementation that, that we're here to talk about today. Um, just a few quick case studies of, of what we've done here in Texas and, and around the world. Um, we're doing uh, significant demand response aggregation, uh, and, and I'm going to get into the first two of these with uh, a couple follow-up slides, but this is a managed EV charging smart thermostat and heat pump uh, program that we've offered to our customers um, called Intelligent Octopus. We're participating uh, in Texas's aggregate distributed energy resource pilot. It's Texas's version of 2222, if you will, um, involving uh, VPPs. Uh, we, we've established a dynamic rate program um, called Fan Club, really meant to drive local adoption or local buy-in to the siting of uh, wind energy. So people who live around a turbine in adjacent zip codes uh, actually get the benefit of a much lower rate when that turbine is producing clean power. Um, in the UK, th this has actually sort of led to a lot of public uh, sort of support for uh, renewable generation and, and uh, overcome some barriers to, to, to local siting. Lastly, um, our, our overall vision for what we're doing is sort of whole home um, or whole business electrification. And, and that's exemplified through Zero Bills Homes. Uh, we have partnered with some 
uh, builders in the UK that are building energy efficient homes uh, with solar storage, uh, smart thermostats and heat pumps. We manage all of those things on behalf of those customers and the net uh, exports from these systems cover all of the energy costs for the home, including transmission and distribution charges. So for the utilities in the room, you know, you're still getting yours under our zero bills home scheme, uh, if you will. Um, so quickly on Intelligent Octopus, it is right now Europe's largest VPP. The numbers on this slide are actually outdated. We just um, uh, crossed 70,000 EVs enrolled in this. And what it is, is effectively a managed charging program where we're optimizing um, uh, EV charging based on both distribution network constraints and wholesale market prices. Um, and it's uh, for the customer, what we're able to deliver through the billing side of our program is a dramatically reduced rate, a third lower than what they would normally be paying on their energy rate. Um, and and uh, while also providing this balancing um, and, and grid stability service to the grid, it's grown from 600 EVs uh, when it was first launched in January 2022 to uh, over 70,000 today. Uh, we've also demonstrated um, using uh, bi-directional Nissan Leafs the ability for vehicle to grid uh, integration as well, where we were um, participating, where we were injecting their power, aggregating those resources, and also participating in the UK balancing market. Um, and so we we're um, we just submitted our first enrollment into the Texas Aider pilot. Um, it's sim a similar concept to twenty two twenty two but a, a much more rapid timeline for implementation. It went from sort of ideation to a pilot, you know, becoming operational and retailer, retail aggregators, um, you know, enrolling resources in the period of just 18 months. Uh, in phase one, there's 80 megawatts of di distributed energy resources being procured. 40 megawatts are eligible for um, what in ERCOT is called the non-spin reserve service, um, and 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 the, the, the and and 80 megawatts is available for the real-time energy settlements. Um, the the minimum aggregations uh, are are 100 kW for the the non-spin ancillary service market. There's a 30-minute notice, and and you have um, uh, uh, an obligation to provide uh, up to four hours of performance. Um, every aggregation has to have at least one battery, but it's truly DER agnostic. So the aggregations could include other load resources. Um, everything actually in phase one here looks like uh, load. So everything is being netted out to look like load to ERCOT. And uh, as a retail retailer, we are playing a really central role in in this pilot. Um, it's all being all, all of the revenues in the pilot are being paid through our qualified scheduling entity relationship with ERCOT. We are the ones doing the aggregations, uh, and 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 you know the pilot commenced in January of this year, uh, and we're expecting to kind of iterate into phase two with an expansion in in. January of next year, if everything keeps to schedule. So just to go through some of the lessons we've learned along the way um, and, and looking at some of this, I mean, if we're going beyond demand response to an order 2222 construct where these resources are being compensated for injecting power uh, at the aggregate level, one observation, the first observation, and I think it's come up here in the materials I reviewed in preparation, interoperability is key. Um, uh, the interconnection process in Indiana should uh, adopt 
15, IEEE 1547 2018 uh, and its successors in full. Um, one of the real challenges to us being able to submit our first aggregation to ERCOT, which was just approved, has been sort of the lack of access to all of the batteries in that that, that are in the market today. Um, it, it, walled gardens, uh, from our view, are not good public policy, to, uh, and and there are a number of jurisdictions like California that are that are moving towards requiring interoperability through the adoption of 1547 or, or IEEE 2030.5, for example. Um, data access is key. In Texas, we have Smart Meter Texas. Uh, New York has created a data access uh, central hub through its IDER um, system that NYSERDA procured. You have various utilities around the country enabling data access through Green Button Connect. In our view, the best streamlined way to do this for market participants, um, the aggregators that you may have in Indiana, is through a central platform. Um, we actually th have looked at cr whether Kraken could facilitate that um, uh, and, and, and believe um, it, would, it would actually just involve turning off some of the capabilities of our um, customer information system for us to sort of serve as a go-between, a central platform for utility data to flow through to third parties and, and end users. Um, we also would emphasize that you need market rules that actually treat batteries like they are batteries. So I mentioned that the ancillary service that um, DERs are eligible to participate in phase one of the Texas pilot is a four hour duration requirement. That's not really well matched to the dispatch capabilities of the resources. Um, it, we're, we're pushing uh, the PUC in Texas and ERCOT to, to relax that for, for the purposes of the pilot and beyond um, because what in effect happens with that four hour requirement is a fourfold dilution of the commercial value of these resources. It, it really dilutes the offerings that we can uh, provide to customers and is mismatched to the practical capabilities of the resource. Um, we think the approach should be DER agnostic. That means uh, batteries, electric vehicles, um, uh, heat pumps, smart thermostats, any anything that involves controllable load should be kind of focused into these aggregations. And I'll just echo what I heard from Ken here. Dual participation is key. Um, that's one of the barriers in the ERCOT pilot that we're hoping to overcome in subsequent phases, but is this ability to both participate on the retail and wholesale side. And, and we've I've heard a little bit about sort of penetration, like let's wait until penetration reaches a certain optimal level before we really focus resources on this. But I would just point out here as a final note is that we're expecting based on this Wood McKenzie analysis, 262 gigawatts of new DERs to come online by 2027. Um, it's coming and, and there's a need to sort of future proof both the rulemaking construct here against that and, and also I think the technology systems that utilities and energy providers around the world are using um, you know, to ensure that these things come to bear in the future. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any, I'll welcome any questions. Um, just want to thank everyone for having me here again today. Thank you so much for that presentation, Rajiv. Donna, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you just said that um, uh, participation in both retail and wholesale is key. I guess I'm wondering, how do you make sure that the same megawatts are not counted in both? Because 
uh, if you're expecting, I'm just going to make this up, uh, 5KW in retail, and you're also expecting 5KW in wholesale, how do you know it's not the same 5KW? It, and that you're really going to get five from both, which is 10, you're not going to just get five. Hopefully that makes sense. No, that, that does make sense. I mean, I think you you need to come up with the right construct for those two different avenues to to talk to one another, if you will, and 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 address sort of after the fact that this notion of whether or not double counting could happen. I know that in C Power's uh, comments, uh, which I I read, I thought they were they were pretty um, interesting. They they actually proposed some additional safeguards against this issue of double counting. Um, that that might be worth taking a look at. you just talk a little bit more about the challenges uh, regarding the facilitation of, of dual participation? I mean, obviously, double counting is a concern. Um, what are the metering challenges? Is this something that your software or that AMI is, is, is capable of, uh, of keeping up with? Yeah, I mean, we, we, are, we are, in, in the UK context, able to sort of optimize against both sort of the distribution signals that we're getting and and the wholesale signals. Um, I I don't know that you need a separate production meter as as has been suggested, rather than sort of the ability to kind of dig in uh, and and parse out the data from the existing meter infrastructure. Um, I can provide some follow up on that, but I would have to kind of go back to the technical people. That are implementing this um, on our end to, to to get you a little bit more insight there. So, um, just because I know a lot about their system, <laughs> they do have sub metering and different things that they put in. So that's what he's talking about with being able to parse that out uh, versus having to have different types of utility meters or different things going forward. But um, structurally within the regulatory piece for you guys to be thinking through, it's really, uh, there's some considerations, which again, the California battery ruling, the New York programs for dual participation, they're, they're good to look through because they've clearly established hierarchy in dispatch uh, in terms of it can, it's a resource that's dual registered so it's in a retail program and a uh, wholesale program, but depending upon which program dispatches that resource, that's how it gets compensated, and the structure of the compensation depends upon um, which ones of those calls are being issued to that resource. So it's basically attempting to say that what is the highest and best use of the D
Again. All right, if we can uh, move back to our seats, we're going to uh, introduce our last presenter for the afternoon. Hello. Hey, guys. All right, fantastic. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce our last presenter of the day, Chris Hickman um, from uh, Collaborative Utility Solutions. Chris, take it away. Thanks, Steve. Um, there is a lot of slides in the deck that I posted. We're not going to cover nearly all of them, <laughs> just FYI. Um, my name is Chris Hickman. Um, as Ken and I look like, Joanne doesn't look like, but Ken and I look like we've been in the industry a long time. Um, <laughs> it's the short answer. Um, so today I'm going to cover, we formed a nonprofit company uh, a little over three years ago um, after I spent about a year abroad in Ireland, Australia, and Germany um, doing different assessments around uh, DERs and the stakeholder processes and Q&A that we ran through there identified uh, a collaborative shared data set as the number one issue for this ever working and trying to um, simplify the overall administration of this so that people could focus more effectively on actually how to use the resources instead of spending, I've been clocking the time today just FYI, there's been 31 minutes of the presentations and Q&A associated with the administrative process of, of these questions that, by the way, the registry's already solved. Um, so a bunch of these issues we'll go through today and I'll be able to give a little bit more information on that. Um, so just in a general sense, um, I would, there's lots of ways to break 2222 down and I, our version of this is just to simplify the discussion, is there's obviously a phase one, which everybody is in right now, that's doing all the legislative and regulatory rules. I will, as I always do, reemphasize 1547-2018. Adopt, adopt, adopt. Stop letting stupid equipment be put on our distribution systems. Um, do, don't <laughs> allow equipment that isn't compliant with this to be out there. When you've got a country like Australia looking to spend $1.8 billion to replace every single inverter in their country because they can't communicate to them, they don't operate in a four quadrant fashion, and it's crushing the operational capability of their grid. We need to stop what they call dumb energy bricks from being introduced onto our systems, and we need to adopt 1547-2018 to make sure that is not occurring. There is a lot of other processes that will happen in this. Uh, I always want to encourage everybody to look at and understand the spectacular LBNL report that was produced for Missouri uh, because they are showing that there's an opportunity to do a phased and tiered approach with each strategic issue associated with 2222. It is a great framework for implementation for this process that allows you to go faster on some issues and slower on some issues and have more regulation or less regulation on some issues and give you a little bit of an opportunity to start something with a wait and see approach versus saying we need a lot. No, this one needs to be fully covered first. It's a great framework. The second part of this is just the administrative process and I will uh, tell you that the registry's got this covered. Um, this is what we've put in place. Operational coordination, there are different tools coming of age in the operational coordination, but there is a lot of work to be done here. Uh, in this regard, InRail's uh, tool precise, what Octopus is doing, um, there is a lot of things that are gonna happen in operational coordination. And on the next slide, <laughs> I'll mention that, and. PJM and all the ISOs are very clear that that is the state's problems to figure out with their utilities, okay? Um, and then the last one is going to be settlement. Um, uh, as Octopus actually mentioned, they have a, a full, um, call it ADMS or DERMS or CIS or all the meter data management. There's a host of these things that have to interact together 
The state of Texas actually did a really nice meter data authority, um, a collaborative one so that meter data could be shared. Um, it didn't end up working out as well as everybody hoped and there's been some non-productive changes in it. But in general, when you get to this settlement phase, when we start getting into all these active resources and whether or not you're having one meter or two or all these things, um, the way that meter data management systems and AMI systems work today uh, will not work in the future for these dynamic things because they do not effectively share data. Um, I will, you know, any utility in the room can speak up, but most of them, if they're moving to cloud storage, sometimes that's even a 48-hour process to push stuff up to the cloud before it can be available to anybody. There's all of these things going on, and oh, by the way, the new PJM ruling that just came out requires that you have the meter data available for settlement one day after the event. Um, how many utilities in the room today would provision their meter data to the aggregator to present to PJM in one day? Anybody raise your hand? It's not going to happen. So that is a major barrier to entry until this gets resolved on a go-forward basis. Okay. So um, this filing update, again, just in working with Steve and Beth as we've gone through this, it's just a little bit of information. They've kept the effective date. They have broke the 60-day review process into a capability and reliability review. They basically have reiterated the fact that if there's a DR opt-out, the RERA is uh, going, if the RERA has, in the state has an opt-out, that DR is not going to be allowed to be included in the aggregations of DERs. Um, if you want to do multinodal aggregations, you can, which is a big change because everybody was saying no, no, no to that initially. But if you want to do multinodal aggregations in PJM, you're going to have to only be relegated to energy only. Um, I think that's problematic personally. Um, I think there's, there's a bit of uh, PJM spent 14 pages and presented some spectacular information on this topic around market stuff. But the actual question was technical feasibility. And I'll talk about technical feasibility of multinodal aggregation uh, in just a moment. Um, the, and, and again, I am not a lawyer. I'm an engineer, so I'm not careful with my words. Um, so when I say officially punted dispute resolution and majority back to the state, the point of this bullet is basically saying that um, all of the dispute resolution pieces of different aspects that they list out quite a bit in this ruling, they're basically saying that's on the state to figure out with their utilities to figure those pieces out, which does bring the governance issue back up. And, and I will tell you, it's, it's great just to hear, and I would like to reiterate what Ken said, that I think everybody in this collaborative process just listening to each other, because um, he's like, hey, just for the record, we want the risk. <laughs> we want to take on the risk on the behalf of the customer. Don't put it on the customer. We want the ability to be able to do that aggregation and accept all of the risk for duration of contract. Don't put that on the customer. That's our problem. Um, so I think the, the issues that have come up over time in a lot of these things if everybody just collaborates and listens, the utility issues are met, the commission issues are met, and everybody at the table can get there uh, in a very collaborative way and get the answer that they want. Um, my personal fundamental issue uh, with the ruling that I will tell you all very upfront is that uh, because FERC and the ISOs have no real, quote, relationship or jurisdiction with states, with aggregators, um, there's a whole section in there about saying we are going to do operational coordination with only the aggregator and the utility can catch up whenever they catch up. I understand very clearly why that was said, why that was done, but there is significant concern about safety and reliability and operational coordination of a system when you ignore the distribution utility in the process. And again, I understand why they did it, because they don't have the authority, they don't have the structure in there. 
but my personal feeling is that that should have said, and we need to sit back down with the stakeholder groups to figure out better coordination methodologies between the aggregators, utilities, and ISOs in this process to make this more effective. I think that that is a step that needs to happen going forward, or we could create a lot of different problems on the grid. So, with that quick update, <laughs> I will quickly go through some of these other slides and uh, get to uh, the overview of what we wanted to cover today. So I am, if anybody's downloaded the presentations, I will try to sprint just like Joanne. I can't see. Um, I'm trying to get to slide 10. Um, is that 10? Yes. So collaboration is the key. Um, we have to, as an industry, with 2222, get a better process. This idea of saying, hey, we're going to get one unified thing and then coming out with yet the 14th standard is not going to be a good process. Even today, there was a lot of confusion in both the questions and the answers between whether this is 719, 745 from FERC, just demand response, are we actually talking about a 2222 implementation, which is the kind of the point of the workshop, but <laughs> um, where, what are we talking about? Which issue are we addressing? And I think it's really important that we start separating that because in a 2222 world with active DER resources and drawing a line in the sand, very simply put, it doesn't cost anything to add a second meter and put the active resources behind it with brand new installations. On a cost per level basis of adding solar or batteries or anything else, that disconnect and that second meter are rounding error in that install. Um, however, on a backwards looking basis, it's very difficult adding a second meter and spending that money and retrofitting. Those are all very different issues from a going forward versus a looking backwards and whether we're talking about 2222 or we're talking about 719 and 745 and just demand response. And so within the framework of the conversations, you're going to end up with a 14th standard <laughs> or you're going to have a collaborative process. And I applaud Indiana's approach to this through these workshops because they're getting great feedback from everybody, great input to look at this in a more holistic way so that you can do one process instead of a process for 719 opt-out, for 745 discussions, for 2222, doing one overall process and saying this is how we're moving forward and I applaud their effort to do that. Um, I also encourage everyone to think about this simple picture. Um, we filed a significant set of uh, comments with MISO um, we have spoken with six different ISOs about this concept, um, and we spend a lot of time talking about data needs and data access. The bottom line with everything that we are doing here uh, in 2222 with DERs is that this data is needed by a lot of different people, and it is not just about an aggregator or an aggregator's position to a utility or an ISO or an ISO's capability to have a program, this is getting very discreet around DER data. And NERC, for anybody that didn't see it, just yesterday released the rules and requirements on the IBRs for DER the IBM DER data is for large-scale resources at, uh, attached to the, BEA, the bulk electric system. Sorry, I try not to use acronyms. Um, but that was the first step in requiring this DER data to NERC by law for reliability to make sure that we can manage the system. FERC 2212 for every DER is coming right behind that. Okay, and we have been working hand in hand with FERC and NERC to make sure that the registry has every data element for data modeling, everything that's going to be required by NERC in that process for planning, modeling, and coordination, as well as the administrative data for each one of the different ISOs from their filings be included in the structure. And this is, I think, an important slide if anybody just, I mean, structurally look at it. 
please get out of the seat that you sit in every day and go sit in a NERC seat and think about the reliability of the entire grid and recognize that everybody needs to have access to this data in a collaborative fashion. It's killing Australia right now. They have mammoth reliability issues because of this, and this solves a huge number of those problems. Um, what's in the registry and why? We've spent three years working with a whole host of uh, different groups about this structure, and it really comes down to what is it, where is it, what can it do, and who owns it. And so structurally, this was not meant to be an operational coordination platform. Operation is the sole jurisdiction of the utilities, the ISO, and the aggregators. They already have systems to do that. This was about the administrative data and eliminating the administrative burden of all the processes up front so that you can get DER data into a system, manage that DER data uh, in cooperation with consumers, being able to then allow aggregators to aggregate those sites, be able to enroll those sites and fully administer those sites through an approval process according to a utility program or an ISO market product program according to their rules. So this was meant to be something to eliminate all of the administrative burden, not create a new competitive operational platform. We were filling a gap that didn't exist anywhere in the world when we put this together. Um, SIM is crucial for this. We have spent a tremendous amount of time and are actually working with the SPIDER Working Group right now on a SIM paper around DER data to make sure that the common information model, because every utility and ISO operational system is based on SIM, it's going to make the data transfer of those things for planning, modeling, and operation much simpler over time. And we'll be working through that SIM framework. We actually have a meeting Next week, SIM uh, committee with PNNL and several other folks to dig into this a little bit deeper and making sure that we have all of the parameters structured appropriately. The next really big piece of the registry that's super important is data access. Um, Richard Beeson is our uh, chief digital officer. He spent 32 years with OSI Soft Pi. Pretty much everybody knows the Pi historian in all of our industries. Um, Richard basically built our system so that every single data element, the uh, appropriate RERA for the utility, we would interact with the utility in the RERA, and they can choose for every single data element, first name, last name, whether they get solar panel information, you can have every single data field, you as the rear get to determine who has access to that data. So it's really important in this structure for that capability because there is a tremendous amount of data and it has to be very highly secure and structured in the process. And for anybody like a Michigan that has a really robust privacy policy, when a customer signs into the system and puts their, put their name and their DERs into the system for the first time, they would have to accept the Michigan uh, privacy policy to be able to put their data into the system so that we could track that as well. So the registry does allow structured contractual privacy mechanisms, whether that's between aggregator and consumer or what those things are. Steps in the process would allow those documents to be executed and signed and put into the system. Um, there is obviously a huge partner, God love them, Esri is a big partner of ours. So we can do all kinds of GIS reporting, scale, scope, all the different pieces of that. Um, and just FYI, we have been working with one utility because they're like, well, you have all this data. You have the geographical and electrical location of all of these DERs. Could you do a hosting map for us? And we're like, well, we need two pieces of data to do a simple one, right? We need what's the limit, <laughs> what's, what's your maximum number on the line, and what's your definition of hosting capacity? Is it 10%, 20%, what do you wanna do? And they, so they basically said, well look, let's just set the limit at 10 MVA, and let's say we'll allow 20% of 10 MVA for hosting capacity on the feeder, and so we plug in two parameters and then it hosts up a map. Yes, you can do much more detailed, Ask New York, 
We can do much more detailed hosting capacity analysis than that. But there's simple ways to do this as well. And so the registry could perform that function on a go-forward basis if anybody would like it to. Uh, one piece that we tend to miss in these presentations is the fact that we talk a lot about the DER data. I guess I never spend enough time on the approval process on the right. <laughs> so we allow the creation of aggregations, the management of aggregations, as well as management of the full approval process. We have a host of personas uh, within the system, whether it's ISO, scheduling coordinator, DSO, competitive retail suppliers, and based on whatever the programmatic requirement is with the utility or the ISO market product, we pull those personas into each element of this, and there is a very detailed presentation on the CUS website about how this creating aggregations, managing aggregations, and moving them through the entire approval process is done. But that is all structured, it is all done, and all we do at the end of this process is sit down with the utility or the ISO and make sure that in all of our drop downs when you're registering uh, into the programs that you can just do it from a drop down list, this market product or this utility program. So all of that is structured, all of that is done uh, within the registry. Um, it is also important to recognize that we do allow dual registration um, as long as we have the policy and procedures to ensure there is no dual compensation. So in a, in a jurisdiction that says, nope, we don't allow, uh, we're, we're not allowing this to go to market or we're, we're only allowing market participation, we put that policy into the registry and it can't do whatever the policy says according to the RERA telling us this is what we're doing in this state with this utility or this ISO. Um, so there is a lot of different things that are coming with the registry. Uh, we are currently working with Power Clerk and a utility to do an API so that Power Clerk is one of the leading providers for interconnection process management. They work with a huge number of utilities. We are creating an API so that anything that's happening in the interconnection process management, whether it's the interconnection agreement or any of the detailed data can come across. And the step before that is actually permitting. <laughs> so where data first gets created for DERs is in the permitting process for like solar and batteries or, or interconnections. The first step in that, and so we're working with Solar App Plus because they're becoming a larger and larger part of fully automated permitting, and we're creating an API with them, and we're going to be able to share this data between those applications to, again, limit the number of times this data has to be put in. And if we can get all the way in front of it with Solar App Plus, then all of the data is immediately available for the interconnection process. It's available to the registry. All of these things are already done, and so we're working through these applications to fully integrate them. We're also developing a 2030.5 plugin for all equipment manufacturers, working with SIA and a host of other folks to actually make a 2030.5 plugin. Like if you're plugging your printer in at home, these DERs will speak up and say, hey, I'm here and this is all of my information, so they can actually be auto-discovered and auto-registered on a go-forward basis. We're working with Pecan Street on that. That will be coming next year as well. Um, and we will be doing a big UCA event next year for coordination and collaboration and full integration on a SIM basis to all of the industry systems, and that will be happening. So ultimately, we have a lot of people to thank because for three years, <laughs> we have had a ton of different groups support us do stakeholder processes and get all of this stuff right and make sure that we heard from every element of this process to be able to set this up and make this happen in a good and efficient way. And so the Q&A always starts with somebody going, what's the catch? Um, and for the record, we are a nonprofit 501c6 with 100% fully transparent IRS published resources. So there is no catch, there is no way to hide money. This is a nonprofit exercise. There's just a bunch of Doug's dumb old utility guys and gals that got sick of all of the processes where everybody's trying to fight the future instead of work to make it happen. And so we decided in a nonprofit way to make it simpler and save the industry $40 billion in the process to do it. So with that, 
Q&A. Thank you. This is kind of a question, maybe a statement as well. I, I do appreciate the aggregators uh, being here today. Uh, you have a very valuable, uh, important voice um, and perspective, and so I appreciate that and, and also encourage you to stay involved in the process. Um, we had a number of different kind of business models being presented today, um, uh, maybe some different approaches. I guess this is another statement. Um, I hope that we have a clear understanding of the basis uh, of basic points of, from a regulatory standpoint, what is needed uh, f uh, for the aggregators um, for the impl implement impl implementation of the uh, for quarter 2222. Um, and if we don't have a kind of a, a shared understanding of that, then what's the next step to, to get there? Um, <clears throat> One question I, I do have uh, is the um, question about the proprietary, proprietary uh, nature of the business relationship with the aggregator and the customer. On the residential standpoint, I kind of see that for the commercial. Are there any protections in place at the residential level um, where it might be a lot of s smaller households that might be involved. How broad is your, is your reach as an aggregator? Are you working uh, in communities with uh, households, that sort of thing? I think for, for us, that, that's kind of why we were leaning towards that customer uh, sort of registration notification model, because that gets at some of that customer issue where you know that they're um, like informing the utility and the regulator that they have this relationship and that those provisions would only become an issue if there was, you know, an actual consumer protection issue where, you know, we're already subject to the consumer protection laws of every, you know, <laughs> state we're operating in, but it would come to your attention if that customer felt like there was some sort of consumer issue, but I also think that that's part of some of that stage implementation. For example, Michigan started out with the one megawatt and above customers so that they could get a sense of how the relationships worked and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I do think that we just want to be careful that there's, you know, that we can still have those sort of commercial relationships but uh, and, and rely on the consumer protection function that's kind of already existing in your in your state to make sure that those things, because um, I think it's too difficult for us to have like a lot of a, a one size fits all contract the way the utility does that has an obligation to serve and that sort of thing and has to take all comers and that, so it's a different relationship. So I don't think it can be regulated precisely the same, but I do think there are ways to make sure customers are protected, um, including by just that sharing of information um, that we suggested where the, 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 the customer essentially tells you this is our, how we're, without disclosing the exact details of every contract, but they tell you this is my load, this is how I'm participating, these are the programs I'm in, et cetera. Uh, that's a way to make sure the customer is sort of informed sort of indirectly without interfering with that. <laughs> so I would, so there's, um, and again, I'm not the lawyer, so if she hits me in the back of the head while I'm talking, just, you know, it, <laughs> we, we do need to be careful going forward um, because there's a lot of great work that the ISOs have done for like credit worthiness that can immediately, they've checked an aggregator, it's there why would a state redo that process? Just boom, here we can use it. But some states, are you really under the consumer protection laws if you don't have a licensed uh, DBA within the state and you're not licensed as a state entity but you're operating as an aggregator with some entity outside of the state? Are you really under the consumer protection laws? So it's, it's a what if, and <laughs> that's a lawyer question. And I will tell you that there are not straight answers for all of this. And so to Ken's point, I believe that most of the aggregator community is saying, look, we're fine with the governance, but 
the things that we're not okay with is if we're required to share how we create really unique programs. How do we aggregate these folks? How do we blend these resources together? And ultimately, the utility and the ISO don't care about that. They just care about the delivery. And so this is the thought process in the registry about the consumer assigns an aggregator. It's open and transparent to the commission. That aggregator can create aggregations uh, and enter them into programs. And the privacy policy and the privacy structure and the detailed data that just FYI, NERC is going to require this isn't <laughs> this isn't an option. It is coming that this data, the type of panel, the type of inverter, all of that is coming, and the IBR ruling is the first step in that. And so getting this data in and sharing this data effectively will allow a lot of these issues simply to go away. And I think that the consumer protection pieces and all of that can come very simply with the state adopting a privacy policy around how that works. And I would point to the effort that Michigan did as a really good one, saying this is just what all of our utilities are going to use for that privacy recommendation so that we can share this data effectively and protect our customers in the process. Um, so leverage what has been done with those utilities, don't recreate, but we do have to make sure that the governance is in place state by state according to their rules to make sure that that utility operation <clears throat> and capability can be effectively managed. Thanks so much for that. I, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. We are uh, a little bit over. If you'll just bear with me for another minute, I did want to thank, uh, extend a th uh, thanks and grat gratitude to everyone who presented today. We really do appreciate uh, your participation. I want to thank everyone who attended, uh, be it in person or via WebEx or YouTube. Uh, again, we, we truly appreciate your participation in this stakeholder process. Uh, I would note for next steps that uh, everyone should feel free to submit any comments uh, that they have um, via URC comments at urc.in.gov. Uh, please note that all comments received will be posted on our website. Uh, also, if you're not already on our email distribution list, do make sure you sign up for it. If you haven't signed in to today's meeting, please do that before you leave today. Um, and with that, if there's nothing, our next meeting. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Gosh, I'm going to have to look that up now. October 12th is what I'm being told. Yes, October 12th, 9.30 a.m. That'll be in conference room B. So in October, we'll be back over at the Government Center South. We do hope to see, yeah, it will be an in-person only meeting. We do hope to see all of you uh, in attendance and, uh, you know, bring your colleagues. It's a big room. Um, any Anything else? Yeah, we haven't actually uh, teed up a topic for the October meeting yet, so uh, we're, we're certainly open to suggestions from all of you if we don't get suggestions and you're leaving it to Beth and I to decide, and, you know. <laughs> and with that, uh, if there's anything else for the good of the order, this is the last call. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>